I'm very proud to be here today. First of all, I don't expect that you normally see very many women in this position. On top of that, uh, both being from uh, an academic background, also from an extreme mountaineering background. Uh, and this is part of what I do. I travel around the world and I normally work with the, the biggest companies, IBM, Eli Lilly, uh, Daimler Chrysler, etc., etc. <coughs> and some of what I do, and I was discussing this with Tor yesterday, some of what you do and aspire to sort of giving something back. All of us who've had some kind of success, however we want to measure that, sort of the, the concept of how can we give something back. And I'm very motivated of, and always have been, sort of the humanitarian <coughs> aspect of how can I utilize my resources, <coughs> my person, my story to uh, hopefully give something back and I'll let the world judge whether I'm successful at that or not. And part of what I actually am giving not necessarily back, but I am giving is that I'm slightly, slightly, slightly a part of changing history. Because every time I go out and deal with 95% male dominated environments, no matter what, I know that these people, they at least will have to accept there's somebody out there with this gender, being a woman, who accomplished something that most of us expect men to do. And in that tiny little fragment, I'm changing history. And I can see what has happened, especially in Denmark over the years. I get probably at least still 10 years after summiting Everest, at least two calls a week from school classes, high schools, young people who really want to learn from somebody like me. How did you do it? Why did you do it? And by being who I am and, and keep being sort of a public figure also in that aspect, I'm changing history. And one of my motivations, there was a complex set of motivations for, for trying to summit Everest, but one of them truly was this, I want for the rest of my life uh, to contribute to that no little boy or parent or teacher can tell a little girl, this is something you cannot do because of your gender. And I know that everybody who gets hold of my book or my bio, they are able to say, if she could do that, then what am I able to do, no matter what my socialization, my surroundings, the, the expectations, the normal conventional expectations from society. It's like, if just one person in their life can say, if she could do that, then I'll try to pursue whatever it is I want to pursue, no matter what the world tells me is possible or not. And <clears throat> by... Um, implementing my own recipe in different areas of life, I truly have experienced that a lot of things are possible for me that wouldn't be possible if I didn't follow my own recipe. Uh, and that's something that I would like to you know, discuss with you or share with you today over the next 40 minutes. A very sort of a basic business example is the publishing of my book. Um, I wrote a book about Climbing Everest, everything that happened up there from my perspective. Uh, and I'm very humble about this is my perspective. I know that everybody has their own side of the story. And uh, within the next couple of months, a huge documentary presented or uh, produced by David Bashirs, who was actually on Everest in this uh, uh, very harsh spring. Uh, he's been interviewing over the last one and a half year almost all of us who survived the storm. And I'm joining him tomorrow evening at an opening uh, show that we have here in Seattle. And from his reactions, I can, I, can, I can really feel how overwhelming it's been for him. He was not in the storm, he was at base camp, but talking to everybody. And the huge respect that somebody like me have gained through my way of behaving in that storm from somebody who is as experienced as David. So this documentary is gonna come out and this sort of statement of the human psyche, which is also gonna be like, um, you know, what is it that drives us human beings to really uh, pursue unseemable, unreachable goals? Uh, so I'm, I'm looking really so much forward to it. But everything I learned from climbing I've tried to transform into having success on other uh, life areas. I was the first to publish a book about what happened on Everest. Uh, my disadvantage, my huge handicap is, I'm from Denmark. We're five million people. 
nobody speaks our language, nobody takes us seriously because we're not a financial power, we're not a military power, and understandable enough, we do not have a voice in the global picture. Um, it became a bestseller in Denmark, that's very easy. 5,000 copies, you have a bestseller in Denmark. <laughs> and it's like, who wants to sell 5,000 pieces of anything? It's, it's just too boring. Me being grandiose in my thought pattern, I thought, well, I could see what happened with the American colleagues of mine, John Cracker, into thin air. You probably all heard about his book, which actually came out on the world market one year after mine. But he had the disadvantage of, first of all, being a known American, and also speaking, writing in a language that everybody comprehends. Uh, so I got very inspired thinking, well, I would like just get him to become a millionaire overnight. So how can I do that? And then, first of all, I you know, found out what is it that I want to do, and I'll get back to how to search ourselves to really figure out what could be the next sort of venture in life that we really want to, 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 uh, to transform into measurable results. That was what I wanted. I wanted to put my book out on the American market or the English-speaking market. I'm very loyal. So the first thing I did was, of course, following the, the official lines of command. I had had a very good uh, cooperation with my publisher. So of course, and this is the Egmont concern, it's a worldwide global publishing company. So of course, I went to the top management, presented the numbers that John Krakow had produced. Why do, don't we sort of get this book translated? It's proven itself in the Danish market. There's this boss going on, everything that says Everest. It's just exploding. It's, it's bound to sell. And they told me, which is very Danish, and I don't think it's as typical American, they said, based on our experiences, it's very hard to get a Danish author into the American market, so we don't want to touch it. Well, my loyalty dues being paid there, I sort of thought, well, what did I learn from climbing Everest? I learned that I have to do everything myself. I have to, first of all, break with any kind of conventional expectations. Most of all, inside myself. Being brought up in a very sort of typical, uh, conservative, middle-class family, there were very specific expectations to my career, when to marry, who to marry, uh, how my life was going to it was actually, you know, get your academic career, find a good, a good husband, and then that was kind of it. Onset expectations. So what I've been struggling with, uh, more so when I was younger than now, was sort of breaking free of those inner expectations, which I know from experience is actually what is limiting most people. Then we have all the, the socialized and all the, uh, the limitations that are actually in the real world outside. But the more we break with our inner socialization and change those patterns, the more we can also create uh, in the outside world. It's never going to be easy to be the front runner, but it's possible to sort of niche out more and more space. So after sort of having uh, conferred with the authorities within this business, I thought, what, 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 what did I learn from Everest? And it's like playing a football game. So I'll take the ball and I'll take care that I put it into my, the goal myself without listening to any expert, without listening to anybody with experience. I'm going to do this. So I wasted a lot of time trying to find funding for having the translation done professionally. Denmark is very bureaucratic. After a couple of months and a lot of wasted energy, time, whatever, I thought, well, Again, what did I learn from it? I'll do it myself. So I sat down, translated the book myself, because that was the easiest way of getting it done as fast as possible. Then I tried to figure out how to approach the American market. And me, again, thinking big. Well, what about David Leatherman's show or Oprah Winfrey? If they take it, I'm guaranteed success. They didn't take it. OK, taking it from there. And I think I spent about a year really with perseverance, endurance, uh, fantasy, really a lot of creativity, sending this manuscript to every possible source that I could think of might give this book a life. And that's really something that I learned from mountaineering is uh, there's only one way of really creating success over a lifetime, and that is to keep doing it. 
no, many how, no, no matter how many setbacks, no matter how many no's, no matter which is kind of the worst, is absolutely no. Even, even no, 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 there's just no response. You just present yourself or send something and there's nothing. And then you have to keep motivating yourself to keep going, even though you don't get any support, any recognition, any whatsoever. And that is what it takes to climb the mountain. And that's also, due to my experience, what it takes to do whatever you want, if you want to do something with integrity. Finally, I found a little uh, publisher in Seattle, Seal Press, who really loved this book. Uh, and I sold the rights for $3,000. Being a lawyer, I wrote a lot in small. I believe that these people 